started. So there you go. We're recording this in case you didn't know that. Thank you, Donna. I want to welcome everyone to the Creative Academy, all of our members and several of our guests coming all the way uh, from foreign countries as well. So you get bonus points for that. Uh, make some tea for the rest of us. I want to welcome you for those of you who don't know the Creative Academy is an online writing community that exists to support and cheer authors from all different genres and at all different levels. Uh, and at the end of the thing, I'll be posting a link to our community. If people have any interest in it, you can certainly check us out. So one of the things we love to do at the Creative Academy is to celebrate people's achievements and milestones. And we look at a whole range of milestones. We look at everything from showing up to actually get writing done because that is harder than you might imagine. Uh, we always celebrate when somebody has a chance to complete a draft. We celebrate doing edits and revisions because we do a hell of a lot of that. We're always happy for people who are in the process of publication. And we certainly have people who publish both indie as well as people who publish uh, through traditional publishers. We also wanna celebrate people who pick themselves back up once they get knocked down. Uh, a huge call out to all of you who came to support the writers today because a whole lot of writing is a lot of no's and a lot of no thank yous. Uh, so it is absolutely wonderful when we have the opportunity to have some things to celebrate. Now, one of our most favorite things to celebrate uh, in addition to being writers, most of us are readers. So the thing we love to celebrate is when new books come into the world. Uh, and today we're excited to celebrate uh, along with five writers from the community, uh, their books coming out into the world. So the way today is going to work is I'm going to be introducing each one of the writers and they get 10 minutes uh, and they can split that up anytime, any way that they like. They can do a little bit of a reading and then answer some questions. Uh, writers who will be speaking, be fair warned, I shall be timing you and keeping you on uh, target. I am not afraid to cut you off. I know some of you have spent a lot of time with your imaginary friends, so you might be awfully excited to be seeing real people. Uh, so I'm going to keep you in line. So that will be my job. All right, so with no further ado, let's get started. So first up, I'm very excited to welcome Lisa Duncan. Uh, Lisa Duncan's Outdoor Pursuits and Love of Nature, and in case you haven't noticed, she's out in nature now. She's on a camping trip, and we've managed to snag her behind a library where she has some Wi-Fi, and her pursuit of that kind of nature has taken her all over the world. When she isn't teaching, writing, or traveling, she spends her time hiking and biking trails near her home in Squamish, British Columbia. Lisa is reading today from her memoir, Chasing Africa, Fear Won't Find Me Here, which is coming out, this is an end, we're getting a sneak peek uh, because this is coming out in November. So you're gonna wanna hit your pre-order button on this one. So with no further ado, I would like to pass over to Lisa. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I'm reading from chapter eight. So just to give you a bit of background, I spent um, just over a month in South Africa. I've just finished Namibia and now I'm trying to figure out how to get to Zimbabwe. After a solid week of predictable company in Namibia, I couldn't wait to discover the next set of unknowns in Zimbabwe. Despite my eagerness to get there, starting the process of meeting new people all over again and figuring out a ride on my own made me a tad nervous. It's 1996, to give you context. I joined a group of backpackers in the hostel lounge. One of the guys overheard me asking about bus schedules and piped up. We caught a lift from Zim to Joburg with a bloke named Doug three days ago. He stops here a few times a week. Just ask one of the staff. After a bit more digging, I learned Doug was notorious for making the 1900 kilometer return trip within 24 hours, twice a week. He hailed from Bulawayo, Zimbabwe's second largest city. My guidebook described Bulawayo as laid back despite its former name, Bu Bulawayo, the killing place. Doug made regular runs into South Africa in search of curios to sell at flea markets. It sounded like he may have been smuggling products illegally between the two countries. Even though fellow travelers vouched for him, I was reluctant to get a ride on my own. I walked into the communal kitchen. A young guy was sitting at the table. His legs shook as he took a sip of Sparletta cream soda. The light stubble on his jawline resembled apricot fuzz. 
His dark blonde crew cut and thick eyelashes made him look like he was barely the le legal drinking age. He looked away when my eyes met his. My judgmental side couldn't help asking, what kind of backpacker wears a peach colored Ralph, Ralph Lauren polo shirt? After probing this baby-faced Brit about his travel plans, I could tell Jake was a decent, albeit reserved, 19-year-old. Like me, he wanted to get to Zimbabwe. He wasn't much of a conversationalist, but I, I was wary of getting a lift with a complete stranger. I hoped to have Jake along for the ride and was relieved when he agreed. I asked the hostel staff to keep their eyes open for Doug while we waited his arrival. I woke up early the next morning in anticipation of leaving on the fly. Hours passed, still no sign of Doug. By early afternoon, I decided I'd better look into other transportation options. I didn't wanna be stuck in Johannesburg another night. I was chatting with a staff member about bus schedules when a ruddied faced Rhodesian in his forties rushed into the lounge, Doug. Doug's eyes were volcanoes, his fleshy nose wallpapered with burst blood vessels. He looked like he hadn't slept in days, but he moved like a jackrabbit. His short ginger hair, damp with perspiration, needed a wash. The short sleeved floral cotton shirt he was wearing was wrinkled and had armpit sweat stains. His belly bulge threatened to send a few buttons flying. Be ready to leave in two hours, he told us. After a shower, wardrobe change and cat nap, Doug appeared more presentable when he sauntered back into the hostel lounge. Jake and I were sitting on the sofa with our backpacks resting at our feet, looking like obedient school children, waiting outside a headmaster's office. Meet me outside in five, he instructed us. We did as we were told and loaded up our packs into the back seat of his BMW. The beat up rusted sedan sat low to the ground and matched his, his exhausted exterior to a T. I was anxious about the time. The Bait Bridge border was over 500 kilometers away and closed at 10.30 p.m. I took my seat in the back of the car and glanced at the clock on the dash. It was after 3.30. The second the BMW pulled away, my vigilant backseat driver instincts kicked in, ensuring Doug didn't veer off the road. For reasons I didn't understand, Doug didn't follow the obvious signs leading to the highway. Instead, he began driving along an unlit rural road. Five kilometers in, I was inclined to interrogate him with a point blank. Um, is there a reason why you aren't taking the main highway? Instead, I remained closed lipped. I didn't think it was my place to question him so early on in the ride. Doug must have noticed the look of unease on my face in the rear view mirror. Minutes in, he casually mentioned, my rear light is burnt out. This road has less traffic. I could only assume this route made him less of a target for police. With a trunk full of suspect goods, I'm sure Doug didn't want to bring attention to his Beamer's malfunctioning taillight. A less plausible explanation, but one that crossed my mind, was that Doug was a serial killer. In this scenario, he preyed upon trusting backpackers before dumping their bodies in the desolate countryside. Jake had looked so unassuming when I first met him. Maybe he had been part of Doug's scheme all along. Ooh, Bulawayo. After sunset, Doug pulled the car over onto a wide gravel shoulder with no explanation. I looked outside, an expanse of deep purple had swallowed up the magenta sky. A few of the brightest stars were shimmering, we are somewhere in the middle of the countryside. I saw no houses, no street lights. Doug put the car in park and killed the engine. He opened the door and walked around to the boot of the car. I saw a flash of Doug's hunched over back move up and down side to side. He was rummaging through the trunk in search of something. For what? I had no clue. I sat on edge in the back seat. My jaw muscles were clenched like a vice while I second guessed my decision to get a ride with Doug. Here I was, traveling with a complete stranger in a suspicious car on a dark, desolate road. Aside from Jake and a few random backpackers, nobody knew of my whereabouts. Fear and paranoia began to wrestle with my usually calm mind, filling my head with irrational thoughts. I chewed the skin around my fingernails. The erratic pounding in my chest was met with the queasy feeling that traveled up to my throat from my stomach. I didn't say a word to Jake, who was seated in the front seat but my voice of reason was screaming, what the hell is Doug doing back there? Despite being filled with, filled with fear, I was ready to defend myself against Doug if needed. I reached into my day pack. My trembling index finger rested on the trigger of the pepper spray I'd brought with me from home. Canada Post had issued me this compact canister to defend myself against aggressive dogs during my stint as a letter carrier. I brought it to Africa in case I encountered threatening wildlife. Never could I have predicted my first time using it might be to ward off a potentially aggressive male homo sapien from Zimbabwe. 
Doug slammed the car boot shut. I jumped to my seat and held my breath. I was paralyzed by fear and uncertainty, but managed to hide the pepper spray behind my right calf. A jolt of panic ripped through my chest when the rear passenger door creaked open. I looked over. Doug was unfolding a checkered woolen blanket. He turned to me and said, I'm completely knackered. I'm gonna have a kip in the back seat. Jake, you can drive for a while, yeah? Lisa, you can sit up front and keep him company. Don't need us driving off the road now, do we? My erratic heartbeat returned to normal. I felt so foolish for thinking the worst of Doug. The absurdity of the situation made me smile. I wasn't gonna die after all, at least not at the hands of driver Doug. Jake took the wheel, but struggled to get the car up to 50 kilometers an hour. A thick mist settled into the cool night air. It didn't take long before our journey into the void. Dark void involved dodging and running over a variety of small animals from hares to frogs. When we got to abandon the road, my foot slammed down on an imaginary brake pedal. Watch it, I yelled out as Jake narrowly missed striking two donkeys. Later, he swerved to avoid hitting a pack of jackals while navigating the foggy road. My heart sank when he, we witnessed a lifeless leopard lying on the side of the road as it took its final breaths. Its sleek, muscular magnific magnificence had been pummeled by 3,000 pounds of fast-moving steel just minutes earlier. We were red-eyed, afraid to blink. The possibility of colliding with an animal or driving off into the abyss kept us wide awake and on high alert while Doug snored away in the back seat. I'm going to stop there. That is fantastic. Uh, for people who are wondering why some people are doing jazz hands, because I have people muted, uh, they'll do this as a way of showing applause. Um, they're not all suddenly taking up a Bob Fosse number. <laughs> all right, we have just a couple of minutes. If people have any questions uh, for Lisa, they can put them in the chat and I will make sure that she knows what they are. Uh, but I'm gonna say that is amazing. Um, and a lot of people are commenting that they sort of felt the fear along with you. Um, so I've had a chance to read some sections of this before, and I am also going to say just a fantastic read. If you've ever wanted to travel or wondered what it would be like to do um, kind of that solo travel in, in a perhaps a more dangerous part of the world, Lisa's book is well worth a read. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move us on and I'm going to take us over to Barry. So Barry is celebrating today. He's gotten some good news on his book, which I'll allow him to share. Uh, but I do want to introduce him. So Barry Trutler's World of Words and Song, a smorgasbord of international offerings with a common theme, connection through music. Barry was born in India, has lived in Hong Kong, Fiji, USA, Pakistan, England, and Canada. By turns a seafarer, an IT professional, a business consultant, a musician, and also a writer, he now lives in Vancouver, Canada, where the sea breeze blows. Now Barry is reading from his memoir as well, so you'll see there's some connections here with some travel. And his memoir is titled Traveler, Stories and Songs in the Key of Connection, which came out in September 2021. All right, Barry, will you take it away for us? I certainly will. Thank you, Eileen. And a lovely segue from Lisa's uh, stories. Uh, Ooh, Bulawayo, that's a new travel expression for me now. So um, yeah, thanks, Lisa. And thank you, Eileen and the Creative Academy for the work that you do in supporting authors. I really appreciate it. We all do. Um, so I'm, uh, my book is a hybrid of stories and songs, as you mentioned. Uh, all interleaved around the, the uh, theme of connection through music. Um, and what I'm, and, and by the way, it's fully scored. So if you want to sing and perform and play from the book, you can do that. Uh, if you want to read it as a coffee table book, uh, there's all the lyrics and all the stories are in there. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a story called the Bob Marley connection, going to take us to Southeast Asia <clears throat> from South Africa. And uh, I uh, gonna the, the story's long, so I'm just gonna read the beginning of the story and the end of it. And uh, you'll have to fill in the, the in between in your imagination or buy the book. Um, okay, so here we go. 
Lately it occurs to me what a long, strange trip it's been. Now that's a line from a Grateful Dead song, Truckin'. My long and wondrously strange trip had begun with a voyage from Vancouver across the North Pacific on board a colossal container ship. Now, as we arrive in Hong Kong and the tugs warp us into our modern terminal's container dock, my heart beats a little faster. It's a clear morning and the skyscrapers of Victoria Harbor are in plain view to starboard. Hong Kong is part nostalgia trip and part new adventure for me. It was my dad's first foreign service posting and my home for three years when I was a kid. And, and so I spend my next few days visiting places that resonate from my early childhood. Nathan Road, the Star Ferry, the Peak, Causeway Bay. Uh, we lived off Queens Road in the Central District. And as I look up the side streets, I can picture the block of flats and the little two bedroom apartment my family of four lived in. Hong Kong is a boggling mix of international business, five star hotels, shop till you drop brand name consumerism and winding lanes with outdoor food stalls and street markets and antique shops and churches, temples and mosques. Ostent ostentatious and brazenly materialist, but with backstreet charm. So from Hong Kong, uh, I caught a flight to Bangkok and I spent a few days there and then I caught a train up to Chiang Mai, I spent a few days there and then a bus across to Chiang Rai and I got on a narrow boat down the Mekong River, and that brought me to Luang Prabang, which is a UNESCO heritage site in Laos. So that's where we pick up the story again. One afternoon, while walking back to my hotel, I hear the twang of a guitar in the street silence. I follow the sound into the courtyard of a backpacker's hostel. A young Lao man in his late teens is sitting on a bench, noodling away on an acoustic guitar, playing single notes up and down the neck using a piece of bamboo. He's dressed in jeans, a red shirt under a black and white jacket and flip flops. I ask him if I can listen. He speaks no English, but waves me to a rickety chair. I'm guessing he's a hostel worker on a on a break. I encourage him to continue, and he picks out a melody that sounds vaguely Asian, Asian to my Western ears. I smile and applaud, and after a few minutes, he offers me the guitar. It has an okay action, but the strings are old. I improvise for a bit and then start to play the first song that comes to mind. No woman, no cry. No woman, no cry. Do, 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 do. Oh, little darling, please don't shed no tear. No woman, no cry. The kid breaks into a huge grin and his eyes light up. Bob Molly, he exclaims. I've discovered in my travels that Molly's songs are instantly recognized around the world. He rivals Che Guevara is the most popular image on a t-shirt. The kid's eager to learn the song. He doesn't seem to play chords, so I tear a sheet of paper from the notebook in my day pack and draw chord diagrams for C, G, A minor, and F, showing him where the fingers go. We pass the guitar back and forth, and it turns out he's a quick learner and soon picks up the nice little bass run from G to C, that's iconic to the song. Da, 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 right? He's pleased as punch, and we go over the chord progression and the run until I'm sure he has it. I get up to leave, reaching in my pocket for the guitar pick I always carry with me. I hand it to him, and the look on his face tells me he's pleased to have it. We give each other the classic fist bump, and I head out the courtyard. We've been communicating perfectly well for the last hour in that universal language called music, subdialect Malian. As I walk down the street, I can hear him practicing. The grin on my face matches the one 
I saw on his. And uh, in the book is a picture of the young hostel worker practicing no woman, no cry. Thank you. That is fantastic, Barry. Thank you very, very much. Um, I don't know if you saw, but a lot of people were commenting, everyone's in love with your voice. We think you either should be a radio DJ or do those lovely bedtime stories because uh, everyone wants you to sing and sing them to sleep. Uh, so I have it open in the chat window. If anyone has any questions, I will pull that up. I also have to say very how much I love your whole family in England all clustered together. That just makes me happy. Um, <laughs> yes, makes me happy. Too. The warm and fuzzies that they're there and so supportive of you. And, uh, and I'm very happy to uh, come and sing for anyone. Just send me uh, a ticket. I'll be there. <laughs> I think you may get some people who take you up on that. That's certainly uh, wonderful. Uh, so again, for people, we are going to be posting at the end where you can get all of these books. Uh, and I can see that uh, Barry's is definitely going to be one that people are going to want to get their hands on in terms of also uh, being able to sing along. Uh, there's a lot of comments. I'm not sure if you're seeing them go by. They're going by fast. Uh, but people loving the combination of music and story and scene. Uh, and I do think it is, I think, what I loved is part of your title, sort of that key to connection, because I do think it is that uh, bringing those things together, which is just amazing. So I'd just like to so say much. that in a, we're surrounded, we're uh, immersed in a world of divides at the moment. And for me, I wanted to celebrate things that connect us as in, in humanity. And one of those things I found is music. So uh, enjoy music and, Immerse yourself in as much of it as you can. It's a healing. It's a healing thing. I think we could all use a little bit more of that. And uh, people are agreeing with you. So without a doubt. So I think that's a lovely transition since Barry started us talking about love and connection to actually talking of a little bit about some romance. So I'd like to go over next to Brenda Margaret. Uh, and Brenda writes a little romance. She writes savvy, slow burn contemporary romances with ordinarily amazing characters. In her own ordinarily amazing life, she's had a successful career in radio, television production, before deciding to pilfer from her retirement plan to support her writing compulsion. Readers have called her stories poignant, explicit and steamy, interesting, intriguing, and entertaining. And quote, unlike any romance you've read before, unquote, which she assumes was meant in a good way. And I suspect that it was. So Brenda is going to read today from Loving Between the Lines, a romance that is just a few weeks old. This is a brand new book, baby. This one just came out in July, uh, July 15th. So with no further ado, I am going to pass over to Brenda. Thanks, Eileen. So I'm going to be reading the second scene. You don't really miss much by not hearing the first scene, but this is the meet cute between our two main characters. Benjamin Whitestone stepped into the concourse of the arena and closed the door to the Canyon Cats office behind him. His meeting with the owner of the junior hockey team was over, and now he could concentrate on his next challenge, his first official practice. He strode toward the stairs leading down to ice level. As he reached the door to the arena administration offices, it swung open. He dodged to avoid being struck by the heavy metal panel. A woman with her arms full of child stumbled into him. Careful now, he gripped her biceps to steady her. Two black bags draped off her shoulders and the sharp corner of one thudded against his thigh as she spun around. He released her and rubbed his leg. Sorry. She shifted the baby to her other hip and gave him a quick harried glance before focusing once more on the squirming, squawking bundle. He had little exposure to children, but given the length of the legs kicking at her thighs and the arms flailing about her head, this was no newborn. Other than that, he had no clue. I should have been more careful when I opened the door. I hope I didn't hit you. That voice. Husky and low, it evoked a sudden memory of subdued lighting, sultry jazz, and smoky whiskey. Lynn? His palms tingled. 
remembering the smooth curves of the shoulders he'd just been clutching. Her chin lifted and their eyes met. For a moment, her expression remained blank, and then she blinked. Benjamin? The baby continued to wriggle and wail, and she bounced and jiggled in the age-old way of mothers everywhere. What are you doing here? He could only stare. He thought of Lynn more often than a one-night stand deserved, especially a one-night stand that had occurred two years ago. Of course, it had also been the day after his father's funeral. Maybe the pain of that time and the comfort she'd given him was why she'd stuck in his mind like no other woman ever had, before or since. She asked you a question. Answer, you dummy. I'm the new head coach of the Canyon Cats. Her eyes widened. You're Benjamin Whitestone? In the dim light of the jazz lounge where they'd met, and later in the hotel room he brought her to. He'd been too caught up in first misery and then passion to remember the color of her irises, but saw now they were a bright pale blue. Yes? He couldn't help the upward lilt, though it made him sound like an idiot. Reeling from this unexpected encounter, he wasn't certain of anything, even his own name. I read you'd been hired, but I didn't realize that Benjamin was, well, that Benjamin. Since they hadn't bothered to exchange last names at their first meeting, that made sense. I've thought of you, often. The truth blurted out before he could stop it. How have you been? Her eyebrows quirked up and she shifted the now restlessly dozing baby on her hip. I'm doing well. This is my son, Oscar. He's a year old, just last week, actually. His head spun as if a giant defenseman had laid him out flat with a body check and his skull had bounced off the ice. Scrambling to do the math, he stuttered, a year? And we, is he? No. Her tone was firm and laced with amusement. Relax, he's not yours. Oh. Surely the rush flooding his body was relief. He'd never wanted to have kids. He'd been a disappointment as a son and couldn't imagine what a mess he'd make of being a father. So you're married? Oh God, had she been married when they'd had their night together? She'd said she was single, he remembered asking. Had she lied? Also, no. The amusement was gone, exasperation in its place. Before you jump to any more conclusions, let me explain. Though I can't see how it's any of your business. The baby, whose name he'd already forgotten, lifted his head from her shoulder and squawked. She cradled his skull in her hand and joggled rapidly. I'm in a hurry to get home so we can have a proper nap, so you'll have to save any questions for later. I am not and never have been married. I wanted a child, so I did in vitro fertilization, starting the process a month after we met. Oscar is the result of that process. The baby squalling took on a frantic tone. I have to go. Congratulations on the new job. Good luck. Before Benjamin could say another word, which was probably for the best, given his foot and mouth disease, she was gone. What a great and place to leave that ending. That was perfect. <laughs> it's probably plenty short enough, but I should have explained to you beforehand for um, the people that haven't heard it before, like Gabby and Sharon. <laughs> Um, that my main character is actually 40 years old. So she became a mom at 39. So we've got a, an older mom that's a single mom with the younger hockey coach going on there. Well, and as a girl who likes her hockey, I, I'm, I am intrigued. That's all it takes for that. Um, so you may not be able to see the chat window, but lots of things going down, people liking the reading, loving the foot and mouth disease and loving that awkwardness. Uh, and I saw much earlier a comment go by people who hadn't heard the term meet cute before. So those of you who uh, like a little romance, meet cute is that moment when our uh, hero and heroine or two heroes or any combination thereof come together uh, and have a chance to meet for the first time and you already see the sparks flying. Uh, and I think you did a great job with that, with showing also a little bit of that uh, friction, right, that the two people feel. So they. They're going to like each other, but I suspect it's not going to go easily. Uh, so again, that's loving between the lines and that is just freshly out. So congratulations. Thank uh, you. Very happy for that. And also a lot of yays for romance for those of us over 40. Also a big yay for that. 
All right. Next up is a little murder and mayhem. Uh, someone after my own heart. So we have Sharon Mikhailov coming up. Sharon writes romantic suspense. So she's combining a little bit of that romance with a little bit of crime uh, as traditional mystery. She is a historian and a former librarian, one of my favorite types of people. She loves theater and travel. Sharon lives in Chicago with her two cats and she is reading from her romantic suspense novel At the Crossroads, uh, which also is a fairly recent uh, one that came out in just May of 22. Uh, this year. So Sharon, with no further ado, I'm going to pass this over to you. Okay, you scared me actually. Uh, because, well, yeah, because from your description, I thought you wanted me to read from Dead, Dead in the Alley. <laughs> I'm like, that wasn't what I was doing. There's no, there's mayhem. In this. There's no murder. <laughs> I just like a little mayhem. There you go. Yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, this, this, book is the second in the series and so um Max and Cress as the couple have already met so no me quite cute and this is the opening to chapter 24 um and I can tell you that Max loves cars and he loves to drive and Cress being a Chicago city girl has no interest in cars and she's never learned to drive she's 46 and he's just turning 41 and they're in Scotland visiting his family <clears throat> This is uh, Crest. At the time for my driving lesson, Max pulls a fancy sports car out of the garage behind the house. Is this the car I'll be learning on? Max leans his head back against the custom leather seat with a small smile. Definitely not. We'll use the estate rover. If you decide you love driving, I might let you drive one of the sports cars some other time. I stick my tongue out like a six-year-old, and he runs a finger over it. We've turned onto a gravel road near a stone building with a long rectangular paved strip. Max tells me that the structure has been converted into a hangar where Brian houses his two World War I era planes. The strip used to be a driveway, but was lengthened into a runway. Once we're past the makeshift airstrip, we jolt a bit farther to a large paved area of concrete in what can only be called a parking lot on the Grant House estate. It's anchored by a huge corrugated iron shed. That's where we keep, where store most of the cars and all of the maintenance equipment, Max tells me, pulling up next to the double doors. The rover's in here. I managed to maneuver out of the low slung vehicle and sigh, watching Max pull the big wagon out and position it facing toward the road. It's old, but reliable. We'll start with the basics, he says. Then you can practice driving around the lot before we take it on the road. I get in the driver's side and wait for him to come around and sit in the passenger seat to explain how the pedals and gears work. Now, an hour later, he says, at, for at least the hundredth time, let the clutch up slowly until you feel it catch. I push back against the seat in frustration, check the gear shift to make sure it's in neutral, press down on the clutch and turn the key. Press on the brake with your right foot and shift into first. Max's voice is soft and warm. By now, I would think he'd be screaming at me or giving up. He looks down at my feet, which are pressed against the two pedals. My hand grasps the bulb of the gear shift so hard my fingers blanch. The other clings to the wheel as if it's a life preserver. Relax. He strokes his thumb against my neck, under my ear, and I shiver. Not a good idea, I snap, pulling slightly away. Can't move much when you're belted in. He takes a deep breath. Lift your foot off the brake. I grit my teeth as he goes on, now gently let up on the clutch. We roll forward slightly and I squeak. This has happened every time. I grunt and discuss. Press gently on the accelerator. I move my foot from where it hovers over the brake and start pressing gently. Keep slowly letting up on the clutch until it catches. And that's the sticking point. I never feel it catch. Frowning, I push on the accelerator and let up on the clutch, but again, I stall the engine. I'm not meant to be a driver. I put the car back into neutral, push open the door and scramble out. Max sits on the passenger side and smiles at me. He'll get the hang of it, he tells me as he gets out to stretch. Then he walks around the car and slides his arms around me. 
I know he's using the flurry of kisses to distract me, but I don't care. This is my idea of a glorious morning. Maybe I can persuade him to stop the lesson now. We can pull the blanket out that he has in the trunk and make out for a while. Although the scent of gorse, I press my cheek against his chest, the feeling, feeling the smooth wax from his barber jacket slick against my skin. He smells like black cedar wood and juniper from the Joe Malone cologne combination his sisters decided was his signature scent. It's cold and windy, whipping my hair around and chapping my lips. My heart plummets, but I know how much it means to Max that I learned to drive. And here we are, the eager teacher and the reluctant, incompetent pupil. With a quick, quick brush against my lips, Max releases me from his arms and gets back in the car. Let's try again. He waves toward the driver's seat invitingly. Scowling, I slide in and refasten the belt. Right, put your left foot on the clutch. Purse my lips as he repeats the now familiar instructions. And I stall out again. Shit, shit, shit. Turning on him and trying to keep my voice level, I ask, why am I doing this anyway? I've gotten through 46 years without driving. You never know when the need may arise, he smiles. Be prepared, I always say. Were you a Boy Scout? No, but I know the motto. I rub the back of my neck to ease the tension. Can we stop now? I think we have established I have no aptitude for driving. And I'm going to stop there. Um, she does actually manage to get the car to move, <laughs> to move and to drive. Um, the experience uh, is based on my own uh, experience with driver's ed when we had to learn to drive stick shift. We only did it once. I sat in a station wagon. This is in the 1960s uh, because I'm considerably older than Maxine Cross. And um, I stalled out in front of the school um, and I kept stalling out in front of the school. And eventually my driver's ed teacher got out of the car, came around and made me move onto the passenger side and he drove it into the parking lot. And we never tried driving stick shift again. I never learned to drive stick shift, but uh, my big question for you is your driver's ed instructor as cute as this guy sounds, because that might have motivated <laughs> me to learn how to drive a stick shift. Um, evidently, he didn't appeal to me at 16. <laughs> I, I don't think so, you know, but um, but this guy um, looks like um, like David Tennant. For okay, those see? Of you who are familiar with David Tennant, except he's got really, really, really dark hair. Um, I don't sound like him because I can't do any of those accents. But uh, the first the first book's out on audio, and the second book is just going through editing now. And um, so, if you want to hear what Max should sound like, and Jason Clark sounds exactly the way I thought Max should sound, uh, you can find it on Audible. Ah, uh, I, I have to say, for people like audiobooks are a wonderful thing if someone's not. Uh, someone who typically likes to read. Uh, it's a great way to kind of get all those stories in without having to flip the pages if you find that exhausting. <laughs> well, I like so to read the book and then listen to the audio. And yeah, I usually- I like them both. Things. I'm an yeah. evil opportunity girl, but uh, yeah. yeah, I know some people shift it. Uh, so everyone is loving all the uh, things and people are putting in their driver's stories. So that is a great uh, connection. <laughs> Going back to Barry and making connections, we can all share our horror of driver's ed. <laughs> so the last reader that I want to introduce everyone to is a longtime Creative Academy member. I think she's been here since day one, uh, which is Gabby Gray. She's a USA Today bestselling author, and she lives in British, beautiful British Columbia, where her fur baby Chin Poo is keeping her safe from the nasty neighborhood squirrels. Working for the government by day, she spends her early mornings writing contemporary, gay, sweet, and dark erotic romances. While she firmly believes in happy endings, she also believes in making her characters suffer before finding their true love. She also writes romance under the names Gabby Black and Gabby Powell. And I have to say, Gabby, you sound a little bit like Batman with that whole idea of like, working for the government by day, writing romance at the other time. So I think that kind of makes it fun. So Gabby is reading from another book. Again, we have so many books that are just fresh out. She's reading from Hugh, A Gay Romance, which just came out on July 19th. Uh, and with no further ado, I pass over to Gabby. 
Thank you, Eileen. Um, this is from chapter one and we're in Hugh's point of view. Can I help you? Crap. Uh, I'm looking for Anthony Rodriguez. Well, you found him. Yeah, I'm Hugh Bracken. I held up my hand. Was that the polite thing to do, right? He shook it with some strength. Nice to meet you. Why don't you come inside? Without waiting for my response, he unlocked the door and moved swiftly to the alarm so he could disarm it. I took my time. The good looking man was about 30 with tan skin, short jet black hair and deep brown eyes, an inch or two taller than my own 5'10". He beckoned me in and once I cleared the door, he locked it. Our secretary doesn't get here until nine. She'll unlock it and let in the hordes. My eyebrows shot up. A chuckle rumbled in his chest. I'm kidding. We rarely have more than a few people pass through these doors on any given day. I split my time between here and the high school. He unlocked another door and beckoned me in. I sat across from his desk in a metal chair that was more comfortable than it initially looked. He dropped his messenger bag next to his desk, pulled out his laptop and sat. I'm glad you came so quickly. He opened the laptop, hit a few keys, then met my gaze. He made it sound like it was life or death, a chuckle, but forced. Well, it may have been a bit of an exaggeration. First, let me say, I'm sorry Patricia died. Me too. I fingered a warm spot on my jeans. How did you find me? He cocked his head. You were listed on Patricia's birth certificate. Didn't take me long to track you down. The RCMP in Canada was most helpful. This guy had contacted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and they tracked me down. Surely an internet search might have obtained the same result, except I was pretty sure I wasn't the only Hugh Bracken in the world. On the other hand, I didn't have a huge social media footprint. Yeah, okay, I'd be a challenge to track down. You said I have a granddaughter? A soft smile, yes. Marilee, she's 10 months old, healthy despite everything. You mean her mother's death. He sat up a little straighter. You didn't know about Patricia. Know what? Look, Mr. Rodriguez, please call me Anthony. Anthony, I tested the word. Although I was about 20 years older than the guy, he carried all the power in the room. I believed in being respectful. Breathe. Your email came as a shock because Annette never told me she was pregnant. Until two days ago, I was unaware I had a daughter, let alone a granddaughter. I know nothing about Patricia. Now, is Marilee being cared for? He picked up a pen, tapped it on the desk, then put it down again. She's in the custody of someone. Okay, I'm not sure why you called me. His gaze met mine directly. It looked like indecision ward with resolution. Was he about to do something unethical? Was I about to be part of something I might later regret? No, that wasn't possible. I had a granddaughter. She needed me. Nothing else mattered. Patricia was an addict. I waited for him to say something that made sense. Annette's daughter had been an addict? Not all parents could control their children, of course, but my ex-lover hadn't struck me as a woman who didn't dominate everything and everyone around her. How? Annette died when Patricia was 18, ovarian cancer. She'd been ill for a long time. Patricia was having difficulties coping and the school asked me to intervene. He scratched his nose. I tried to, but I was still new at the job. Maybe I should have tried harder, but Annette died. Patricia completed high school and then sort of dropped off the radar. He took a deep breath. Gaynor Beach is a small town, but it's easy to get lost if you want to. Best I can figure, Patricia lived off her mother's life insurance money, set up as an annuity, so she wasn't able to burn through all of it at once. Noise sounded from behind the closed door. I glanced over. Just our receptionist. Ah, I struggled to wrap my head around this. So Patricia dropped off the radar screen. Yes, 10 months ago, she turned up at the ER at Gaynor Beach Hospital in labor. The doctor select successfully delivered the baby, but also noted track marks on Patricia's arms. She claimed she stopped using while pregnant, but Marilee's drug test came back positive. Opioids. Needless to say, I was called. Oh, my God. I knew what that meant. Babies born with drugs in their systems faced all kinds of challenges, especially if Patricia, if my daughter, had been using during the pregnancy. Yes, well, we placed Marilee in foster care, a lovely family in Marina Park, and she thrived. Slowly, the pieces were coming together. As you might imagine, Patricia was distraught at losing custody. She swore she'd clean herself up and get Marilee back. And she did. He nodded. She petitioned the court four months ago. She completed rehab and had six clean drug tests. 
The judge agreed with the understanding I'd have free access to the home and the baby. I take it things didn't go well. At first they did, then she had a friend move in. I didn't miss the emphasis. A boyfriend, the baby's father. Patricia maintained she didn't know who the father was and no one was listed on the birth certificate. Lisa Nett had the decency to put my name on Patricia's. Would have been nice to know I had a daughter, but the time for regrets was long past. So you tell yourself, okay, so this guy, Anthony cleared his throat. I didn't approve. I was in the process of getting Patricia's parental rights terminated when, he squinted, she overdosed. Pain ripped through me. Sure, he'd been leading up to this, but to hear it in such stark terms, words that could never be taken back, I shook my head, not so much in denial as to clear it. So you've taken Marilee back, right? She's back in foster care? The glint in his eye had me sit up and take notice. Patricia went to a lawyer. She had this guy, Oscar, listed as Marilee's guardian. But you said he was a bad guy or that he wasn't to be trusted. Another nod, I did. But simply taking Marilee away isn't so simple. I'm going to have to prove there's neglect. Patricia was sober when she made her will. The lawyer was clear. He didn't see any impediments, nothing that nullifies Patricia's wishes. And yet you called me. Yes, he rolled his shoulders. You can petition the court. You're a blood relative, and the courts almost always side with the blood kin. But time is of the essence. The longer your granddaughter is with that man, the harder it will be. Courts also believe in honoring the wishes of parents. If he keeps custody, it'll be more challenging to sever the rights. What do I do? No way was I going to leave Marilee in the hands of someone not capable of caring for her. A 10-month-old needed someone who could see to her every need. I could do that. What about your job? Whatever. I was on leave for a family emergency. If I broke my contract, there wasn't much they could do about it. They'd find someone else. They had to, because I was needed in Gaynor Beach. You'll need to see a lawyer immediately. I can set you up this afternoon, and I want you to go over and introduce yourself. You showing up might be enough of the incentive for the young man to leave. That simple? His expression darkened. I doubt it, but we've got to try. You have to do whatever it takes. Then let's go. I was already rising, and my and as was my blood pressure. Every minute we sat here chit-chatting was another moment my granddaughter was alone with this guy. No, I needed to get there right away. I love what a great opening and pulling the reader in, right? With uh, especially with a young child in peril, uh, I can guarantee that people are going to want to keep turning pages for that. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, everyone's liking the high stakes. And one of the things that we talk about a lot of times in writing circles is, is that you want to make people fall in love with your character right from the get-go. And I don't know how anyone could not fall in love with someone who is so determined to save their granddaughter, especially a granddaughter that they didn't even know that they had. So kudos to Erin for that. Uh, people definitely want to know more. So that is a good sign. I'm going to ask each of the writers that read today if they would be so kind uh, to put into the chat window a link to where we can find them. Uh, either their website or a link to where to buy the book or both, if you like to do that. Uh, for those of you that attended, uh, I'm going to ask you to give a consideration to checking these out. I know inflation and budgets are a very real thing for everyone, um, but books are a wonderful entertainment that keep going again and again. Uh, and really, the cost of a book. Uh, given the amount of time and effort that goes into them is, is almost negligible. And if you can't, we understand that too, but if you can maybe ask that your libraries carry these books, a lot of libraries do take requests from patrons. So that is a wonderful way you can support an author. And if you have read the book, if you can leave a review, again, that helps other people find the authors. And that is a very huge thing. Uh, in a world with many books and many stories, discoverability is a very big and real thing. So I want to encourage people to do that. So our time is coming to an end. I want to do a big call out and a thanks to my colleague, Donna, 
um, who can wave at the crowd. Donna is the one who got all of this organized and organizing writers is a little bit like organizing cats. It's not always the easiest thing to do. So I wanna give a huge call out uh, to Donna for doing all the legwork to get us all organized. I wanna do a special call out and thanks to those of you who came to listen. Uh, I suspect for some of you, it may have been the first time that you've ever had a chance to be uh, at a um, author reading. And so I thank you for coming and supporting authors. We spend most of our times in our heads. Uh, so you never know when that's going to happen. We did record today's session, so I know there's some interest in that, and we will let you know when that recording goes up. Uh, if you're not a member of the Academy, we will be letting the authors know so that they can share that out. And lastly, I want to do a big call out and thanks to the five people who read today. Um, for those of you who haven't had that experience, it uh, can be tremendously intimidating. Uh, to read your words aloud. And so I wanna thank everyone for being brave enough uh, to write their stories in the first place, persistent enough to see them through to publication, which is a whole another level of skills uh, and an extra special thanks for reading today and sharing our stories. I absolutely love that. I will put in the chat window, a link to the Creative Academy as well as my email. So if anyone who's attending today is not familiar with our group, and you want to get a little bit more information, I would be happy to share that with you. And on that, I am going to wish absolutely everybody a wonderful Saturday, wherever you may be. Um, I know some of you are coming from far and away, so I think it's still Saturday, probably wherever you are, uh, but I hope you enjoyed the day. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.